What's up, friends? My name is Ralph Amsden, and you are listening to The Fortcast. Yet another podcast covering Arizona State Athletics. Do you need another podcast? Probably not. But it's here, and I'm here. And uh, mostly I'm here to have some fun. The Big 12 is a fun conference. Arizona State is a fun school. Despite what our president, Michael Crow, wants you to believe, it's the most fun place to go to school in America. And I hope that the 40,000 plus students that are enrolling in Arizona State for the very first time, whether they're online, on site, or graduate students, I hope they're having the time of their lives and welcome. Uh, I I don't imagine we're going to get 40,000 listeners to our first episode, especially first time students. But uh, I just want to let you know that you're welcome around here. Do you need this podcast? Again, I already asked that, but I know you don't. There's so many awesome options out there. Speak of the Devil is my absolute favorite. They've had me on like 50 plus times. Brad Denny, Joe Healy, they do such an incredible job. My friends over at PHNX that, you know, I've co-hosted that show over a dozen times. Really, really enjoy what they bring to the table. Um, As far as ASU content goes, there's so many good Arizona State-based content creators out there. One of my absolute favorites, Jordan Ham at Sports 360 AZ. Uh, one of my best friends on the planet, and he does an incredible job. I read everything that he writes, all the multimedia stuff he puts up on Sports 360 AZ. I'm not going to be able to do what a lot of these people do, uh, but I can have fun, and that's what I hope this show is. Fun conference, fun school, fun podcast, and uh, and appreciate anybody who is uh, is around and, and spending their time hanging out with me on the forecast. Now, what is the forecast? Uh, it's it's a play on words. It's like a lame triple entendre. Uh, Brick Tamlin's character from Anchorman, the weatherman. Get it? Weatherman forecast. Uh, also, he throws a trident and kills someone in uh, in in that movie. And uh, a trident is kind of what our pitchfork looks like when you put it on our helmets, if we're being completely honest. So this is the forecast. This is a way to throw out some some talk and some ideas on ASU athletics. And uh, that that's it. That's all we're going to do. It's very much not complicated. And like I said, I I know that you have a choice and how to spend your time. And I'm very grateful that you spend it here with me. Uh, How might you know me? Uh, I mean, it doesn't really matter that much. I'm just uh, an an ASU fan. And uh, we try to be accepting of everybody, both literally, uh, as far as our 90 plus percent acceptance rate into our college, and uh, just in the fact that... um, if you want to be a Sun Devil fan, you didn't go to school at ASU, you're just interested in ASU athletics, you're welcome around here. Um, so trying to create a welcoming environment with this. Um, but as far as my story, doesn't matter all that much, but I'm an ASU 2009 graduate, been a fan since the 1996 Rose Bowl run, the shutout of Nebraska, Jake Plummer, Pat Tillman, the whole nine yards. Um, a very, very typical Sun Devil story. I do believe I was an ASU basketball fan before I was a football fan. I think they gave out free tickets to my elementary school, and I got to go to a game at what is now called Desert Financial Arena, and I believe I saw Dwayne Fontana dunk on somebody. And I said to myself, this is the greatest school and the greatest sport in the world. Um, and then, you know, the, the the football team, by that time, they had my attention as well, had the opportunity to to go to Arizona State, not right out of school, uh, but by the time I was about 25 years old, 26 years old, I enrolled in the in the Cronkite School of Journalism. My goal was to be the next Al McCoy. I just wanted to do play by play. And then somebody told me that my voice sounds like Seth Rogen ate Ray Romano. And I realized that uh, while there are people out there who have unique voices in play by play, shout out to Petros Papadakis, um, I'm probably not going to be one of them. So I switched my major over to uh, creative writing and English literature. And, uh, it, it was a little bit of a bummer, but at, you know, being 25, 26 years old, already having a couple of kids, I wasn't going to be able to do a lot of the free internships that these incredibly driven Cronkite kids do, uh, when they get out to, to, to school there, that's a big part of, of being able to get into the industry is working for free. I didn't have the ability to do that. So what I ended up doing was, uh, was getting an English degree and then just trying to scrounge up work here and there to see if I could ultimately make an impact in the sports media landscape. Uh, and then in 2015, after covering high school football for three years, I had an awesome opportunity to come on as the managing editor of devilsdigest.com, a Rivals affiliate. Did that gig for about two years and then transitioned into being the lead recruiting reporter 
left that in about 2019. And ever since then, I've just been in the role of a, a fan and hosting Wednesday night uh, Sun Devil Spaces on Twitter. If you've been part of that, man, that has been such an awesome experience. Um, I had a podcast covering ASU called Devil's Junkie Podcast. Did that for about four years. Had another podcast uh, that I did for about two years called The Devil Train in the Herm Edwards era. But it kind of stopped being fun when Arizona State was under NCAA investigation. And uh, I like to do things that are fun. So Sun Devil Spaces really became my outlet to hang out with the uh, the Sun Devil community. We've had so many awesome people be part of that over the years. Kyle Dodds, a regular contributor, Demario Richard, Kyle Murphy, Gus Farwell, and then just so many of my friends, um, you know, wh whether they make content covering Arizona State or not. Uh, these are the people that are out at the Crafty Devil's Tailgate. These are the people that are donating to the Sun Angel Foundation. Um, and, and you know, <laughs> it's been it's been a fun ride with Sun Devil Spaces. I mean, we used to get Kenny Dillingham in there as a listener when he was an assistant coach at Florida State as well as at Oregon because he just wanted to know the vibe of the fan base and, and had his eye on the job someday. And so, you know, I'm going to continue to do Sun Devil Spaces. Love, love hanging out with, uh, with uh, fellow Sun Devils. Um, that's the best thing in the entire world, but this gives me a really cool opportunity to talk about Arizona State in the context of of its journey in the Big 12 and just to have a little bit of fun doing it as well. If you have any questions for me, you can always reach me, ralph.amsden at gmail.com. We'll do a few mailbag episodes here and there. Um, and you might notice this is a solo show. There are not a lot of those. I do like to talk to myself, spent a lot of time grounded as a kid, pretty much perfected the art. So uh, if you find yourself talking back to me on this podcast, jump in on Wednesday Night Spaces. That'll actually give you the opportunity to to interact with with me and and some fellow Sun Devil fans. As far as this goes, we'll do some mailbags. We'll have some guests, but I plan on this being a, a once or twice a week, about forty five minutes. Maybe we'll pivot to video, but I'm not the most attractive person in the world. I I know that a few of you know what it feels like to be the ugliest person in Tempe. Um, a lot of good looking people out there and I wasn't necessarily one of them. So if we keep this an audio only medium, I'm fine with it. But, uh, my guess is we'll do some video interviews as well. I'm going to try to get as many current athletes, current administrators, current coaches, as well as the, the, the important ones to me, the people who have actually had the Sun Devil experience, the alumni, the fellow fans, the former athletes, former coaches to bring them in as guests as well, uh, is a big goal. Um, but there's going to be some regular segments on this show every single week. We're going to try to have a little bit of fun. And yeah, welcome to the forecast. All right, welcome to the headline segment. Each and every week, we're going to spend some time talking about the biggest stories surrounding Arizona State University. There is no bigger story right now than the fact that the football season is right around the corner. And, uh, is there a lot at stake this year? I, I don't know. I don't know what the vibe is from the fan base. He, here's what I do know. I know that a lot of grace is being given to Kenny Dillingham to show progress this year. And in year three, you know, the whole three year turnaround that Jed Fish was able to institute at University of Arizona. That's kind of the model, right? You start to get some of your guys in. You start to establish your culture. Some of the young guys that you've brought in start to contribute in year two. You go to from, from uh, plucky competitors to winning a couple of games that you shouldn't in year two. And then in year three, that's when you really show them what you got. And I think that that's probably what most people's expectations is of this Arizona State football program. But I would push back that there is one person who matters quite a bit who has a little bit higher expectations than the community. And that's Kenny Dillingham. My personal belief is that this man was trying to win now last year, and he's trying to win now again this year. And that's what makes this so interesting is that a lot of people are willing to exercise a lot of patience with Kenny Dillingham, a coach who is in his early thirties in his second year ever as a head coach coaching at a school that he went to, you know, he married an ASU cheerleader. He was a GA at Arizona state. He coached under Todd Graham since then, he followed Mike Norvell to Memphis, spent time at Alabama, spent time at Florida State, went and linked up with former Arizona State GA Dan Lanning at Oregon to do some special things, and then got the opportunity to take over at Arizona State because our entire program uh, went through absolute hell, and we're not going to get into the Herm Edwards era on this particular podcast, but I think that Kenny Dillingham is trying to win right now. 
I think that that's why he made the the uh, the transfer portal such an important part of what he was building. And I know a little bit about his transfer portal philosophy. It's not just take as many players as you can. He believes a lot in roster balance. He does believe in recruiting from the high school level, but he wants to make sure that if you can piece your team together to have one freshman, one sophomore, one junior, one senior, he's going to try to do that because he thinks roster balance in talent is as important in roster balance in leadership and maturity. So he's in the process of trying to execute his vision, and I think he wants to win right now. You know, I think the the Vegas win total for Arizona State is four and a half games, and I'd be willing to bet that the internal win total for Kenny Dillingham, where he might actually be satisfied with the 2024 season, is somewhere around double that. Um, can he pull it off? We will see. I'm uh, I'm certainly intrigued. I think the Arizona State is a lot more talented than it was last year. So much of it's going to come down to quarterback play, and we'll talk about that as well. But uh, this would typically be the segment where I get into um, some fun headlines that have to do with more than just football or basketball, some things going on with Arizona State University that we can laugh about a little bit. But this is your football season preview episode. This is your Wyoming week preview episode. So we're going to stick to football. And um, I feel uniquely qualified to talk about this week's game. Let me tell you why. I am from Sheridan, Wyoming, and I spent my early childhood years uh, going to classes in Laramie, Wyoming at University of Wyoming with my mother, who was a single mother at the time. There was not uh, child care in the late 80s um, that was uh, su- sufficient uh, for a, you know, a starving student to, to be able to partake in. So she helped organize a little uh, um, uh, daycare share program. But when that wasn't available, she would take me to classes. I actually have a University of Wyoming student ID from my time there um, in, in the late 80s uh, when Fennis Dembo was, uh, was dominating the uh, basketball court. And uh, when University of Wyoming was having to deal with both Thurman Thomas and Barry Sanders sharing a conference, I believe it was the Big Eight or something like that with Oklahoma State. Uh, Because of that, because she went there and because I had uncles that went there, I have always been hyper aware of everything going on with University of Wyoming athletics. And when Arizona State's not involved, that's my default fandom. I love Wyoming basketball more than anything. Wyoming football is not the most aesthetically pleasing thing in the entire world. But I like keeping track of them as well, and I kind of fell in love with Wyoming football the same year that I fell in love with ASU football, 1996, when University of Wyoming um, went uh, like had 12 wins and didn't go to a bowl game. I think that was the absurd season they had because only one team out of their conference was allowed to go to a bowl. That conference championship game came down to them and BYU, and they lost in overtime. So as disappointing as the Rose Bowl was, as disappointing as uh, as David Boston catching a pass from a from from a hometown boy um, to, to beat ASU in, in, in the Rose Bowl, ruin ASU's national championship hopes and their undefeated season hopes. I was also going through it with University of Wyoming. So it's been a hard luck road for 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 rooting for both schools. And here we are in uh, 2024. They're going to lead the season off against each other. And uh, yeah, so I, I, I have a unique opportunity to uh, to speak into two things that I feel like I know a little bit about. Hopefully that adds another element to, to this preview episode uh, that you're not going to be able to get anywhere else. Um, and if you can get it somewhere else, then uh, go do that. But I, uh, I, I it is going to be a unique experience. I'm flying. I live out in Charlotte, North Carolina and have since 2021. I'll be flying back in for this game. I will feel conflicted in the stands. I, I'll, I'll be honest. Do I want Arizona State to win? Yes. Is there even a single part of me that wants Wyoming to win? Not really. Because this doesn't matter for them that much. They're not going to win the national championship. But in my heart and in my gut, it you know, um, only bad things can happen when both of these teams are involved. It's it's hard for me to believe and that there's going to be an outcome uh, where where I leave feeling fulfilled and happy. One of my teams is going to have to lose. And uh, one of the teams I root for just happens to make everything feel like a loss. And that is University of Wyoming. So let's get into Arizona State and Wyoming. This is uh, currently the line is Arizona State favored by six and a half. That's a very, very interesting line, given that Arizona State's record against Mountain West opponents. Not that great. They lost to Fresno State last year, 29 to nothing. I believe they had a a loss to to San Diego State in the Herm era. They had a loss to San Diego State in the Todd Graham era. 
I uh, still have nightmares about 2008 losing to UNLV. So, you know, not not a lot of luck. I, I think they have a bowl game loss to Hawaii. They have a bowl game loss to Boise State. Not a lot of luck when it comes to playing Mountain West teams. And Wyoming is probably the least fun of all of them. They run a power offense. They run a ball control offense. They don't really do anything sexy or fun, and they don't take too many risks that would allow you to capitalize on their mistakes. Um, throwing on them is difficult. Very difficult. Only twice in the last two years have they given up a 300-yard passing game. And you might be saying, well, this is a new era. They have a new head coach. Craig Bowl stepped down and retired to go fish the Powder River at 65 years old. And you are correct. But he named his son defensive coordinator, and he passed the uh, his the succession went that his defensive coordinator, Jay Sawvell, became the head coach. I don't see too much change happening with this Wyoming team. I don't expect them to come out in the spread offense or anything like that, even though, fun fact, Wyoming was one of the first teams to try to institute the spread. They did it by hiring Dave Christensen, who was the University of Missouri offensive coordinator at the time, and Dave Christensen brought with him an offensive coordinator named Marcus Arroyo, who is currently the offensive coordinator of Arizona State University. So a fun little history lesson. Uh, there are a lot of Arizona State fans who aren't the biggest fans of Dave Christensen, uh, related to certain NCAA whistleblower uh, scandal activities. And uh, there are a lot of Arizona State fans who are looking very curiously upon Marcus Arroyo and what he's going to add to this offense and if he will really be the key difference that helps the Arizona State Sun Devils level up um, and be in a situation where they're going to be able to win some games that they weren't able to last year. If you remember last year, and I know a lot of us are trying to forget, they were about 12 points away from being 6-6. Six and six. And, uh, and about 20 points away from being 7-5. and five. And so Marcus Arroyo can make that difference in close games. You're going to see a massive, massive leap in overall success for the Arizona State Sun Devils. But I've known of Marcus Arroyo for a long time. That's what I'm trying to say. He was the offensive coordinator there when my favorite quarterback uh, um, in Wyoming history prior to Josh Allen, Austin Carter Samuels, was there. And Austin Carter Samuels did transfer route um, after uh, you know playing in that offense. He, he ended up going to Vanderbilt, and that crushed me at the time. But before he left, they had a couple of uh, um, uh, they, they had a competitive run. They had a competitive run, and it was a lot of fun. And I'm hoping that Marcus Arroyo can help Arizona State be a little bit more competitive than they were last year. We'll get more into him and what Arizona State has going on in just a moment. But let's get back to Wyoming. Who is this team? Why should Arizona State be concerned? Here are the basics when it comes to University of Wyoming. They run a power offense. They run a North Dakota State answers-based defense. You might be saying, what is a North Dakota State answers-based defense? Well, if you're an Arizona State fan, you know, it, because Brian Ward is from that coaching tree, and it's a lot of exotic blitzes, and it's a lot of uh, variables that are just dependent on what the offense shows you. You have an answer for it. Uh, I think a lot of people were very happy with how the defense looked under Brian Ward last year. Understand that what Wyoming has brought to the table the last few years is the extreme version of that. They have allowed two 300-yard passers in the last two seasons, once each year, and six times in each season, they have held the opponent's quarterback to 200 passing yards or less, including University of Texas last year, who was only able to throw for 131 yards on Wyoming. And that game was in Austin, and it was tied 10-10 to -10 in the fourth quarter. This is an annoying team. Uh, they play a tough brand of football. They have four returning starters on the offensive line. Uh, Evan Svoboda, their quarterback, is actually from Mesa, Arizona. Fun fact about Mesa, more people in that city than there is in the entire state of Wyoming. Uh, but he's a big boy. He's about 6'5", 245. He's got a big arm. He's not necessarily going to pick you apart all over the field, but if you give him the opportunity to stretch the field, he will. He's also not the easiest guy for the opposing defense to bring down. They have a bevy of running backs, the best of which is Harrison Whaley. He's not playing. So, you know, you're going to deal with the North Carolina transfer. You're going to deal with a couple of other running backs who are no nonsense. Their whole uh, goal is to get to the second level and then find a hole and run toward it. There's not a, a lot of cutting. There's not a lot of dancing. It's just if, if you can get us in second and four, we're going to find a way to get to first and 10 over the next two plays. That is the way their offense operates. It takes a lot of time off the clock. It keeps the game very, very close. And then defensively, they're returning seven starters. There are no superstars on this defense, 
though, interestingly, Arizona State does not have as many players that they've put into the NFL uh, as Wyoming does over, you know, the last decade. Um, Logan Wilson, Chad Muma, there's some really, really good defensive players that have come out of uh, University of Wyoming in the Craig Bowl era. Um, and, you know, they got a weight room, too. They develop some of these guys and they develop them well. This defense is going to have a lot of experience. It doesn't have a lot of stars. So if Arizona State has any opportunity here, it's going to be to get the ball in the hands of some of their playmakers, your Jake Smiths, your Jordan Tysons, let them outrun some defenders. And then hopefully that creates an opportunity for you to put points on the board because Wyoming's not going to match you touchdown for touchdown, especially if you get up to 25, 28 points. So who do you have to worry about on this defense? Really, it comes down to one player for me. Defensive tackle Jordan Bertignoli, uh, you know, he had 60 solo tackles last year as a D tackle. Think about how insane that is. He had 60 tackles as a defensive tackle. He can shed blocks. He doesn't look like much. He's, he's not somebody who you look at and you're like, oh, what an athlete. But he's a dad. He's got that dad's strength. Um, and, uh, and he's a problem. He's a problem. And it's going to be fun to see Arizona State's offensive line, especially Lee Fautino, the, the center, uh, go up against Jordan Bertignoli. Uh, I know that ASU is missing Sean Nas. Injury reports came out. It's it's going to be tough to 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 get some room on the line of scrimmage to get a push, but you got to try. And I believe Arizona State's offense is very very dedicated to the run, and I think we're going to see a lot of attempts. But it might be tough to to establish some space early on. Now I do have faith in Arizona State's offensive line. If you just take the top three running backs from last year, Kyson Brown, Cam Scadaboo, to Carlos Brooks, they had 235 combined carries at about 4.89 yards a carry. That's actually very, very good for as much as uh, people um, are not confident going into uh, to 2024 with Arizona State's offensive line play. The one thing that they did well last year, and they have more experience than they did last year, they're certainly older, uh, they actually did get a decent push in the run game, especially considering there weren't a lot of people respecting the pass. So if you do have the ability to make people respect the pass, maybe you'll be able to spring some big runs. Uh, but that that can be tough when it comes to Wyoming's defense. The other thing that I really feel like you need to worry about with this Wyoming team, John Hoyland. Who is John Hoyland? That sounds like a kicker's name, doesn't it? Well, it's because it's a kicker. He is their kicker. He's in his fifth season. Um, and two years ago, he was a Lou Groza finalist. He hit 22 out of 25 last year. Not so great. 13 out of 20, but the whole thing with him, and I know that they kick at elevation 7,200 feet or whatever, but he has 50 yard range, no matter what field he's on. And if they're doing that thing where they get 12 plays for 50 yards on offense, just handing the ball off at I formation every single time, he's going to score some points for them. And what you, you know, you're going to have to be able to answer that with touchdowns or you're going to be playing with fire a little bit. So when it comes down to what you should watch for from this Wyoming team, not a lot of mistakes, great physicality, incredible eye discipline from the from the defense. They do not match Arizona State's level of talent. And anytime they would get somebody that would be uh, worthy of being an Arizona State level of talent, either Arizona State or USC goes and gets them. Solomon Bird, USC took him. Xavier Valade, ASU took him. Anytime that you get good out at Wyoming, it's a farm system league now with this NIL stuff. So, you know, there's not going to be a lot of athletes that you look at when it comes to this Wyoming Cowboys team and you're just intimidated by the look of them. However, they got, like I said, they got a weight room too. They work hard too. They're division one athletes too. And they take this very seriously. They're going to come into this game fresh and that could be dangerous for Arizona State. What are the keys to victory? for ASU. Well, I brought it up before, Marcus Arroyo. It really is how how this offense is called, how you limit mistakes and how you create opportunities for explosive plays. This is not a defense that gives up a lot of big plays. They're very very disciplined. I think, however, Arizona State does have the ability to do some screens, to do some bubbles, to do some slants and make them try to tackle over and over and over again. Where I worry is this is not a matchup that is new to Marcus Arroyo. Marcus Arroyo is the former head coach of UNLV. 
in his first ever game at UNLV, he went up against this Wyoming team in Las Vegas. Now, obviously different rosters. That was four years ago, but it was a Marcus Arroyo called offense against a Jay Sawville called defense. Jay Sawville is now the head coach of University of Wyoming. That game was 38-7 Wyoming going into the fourth quarter. And it, even being down three, four scores, UNLV spent most of the time trying to establish the run. I think they had a 60-40 split in run versus pass. Now, does that mean that's what Arizona State's game plan is going to be against Wyoming? Is it actually better that, uh, that you know, Marcus Arroyo had the experience that he had and he can adjust from that? Or these two completely different teams and it's going to be two completely different game plans? All of that is possible. I just know that I watched this play caller, this head coach, go up against that defensive coordinator before, and I'm aware of the result. Now, Arizona State has much better players than UNLV. That is that is an absolute fact. And if it comes down to the Jimmys and Joes, you got to hope that Arizona State's talent wins out. But there is some cause for concern there. And with Marcus Arroyo comes uh, Arizona State's new starting quarterback, Sam Levitt. Now, I wrote an article for Sports 360 AZ um, that kind of summed up some of the op uh, opinions I've given for the last six months when it comes to Sam Levitt. And, you know, there was definitely a mixed reaction to this article, which I expected. You know, nobody wants someone to come in before the season starts and say, here are all the questions I have and here are my concerns. What you want going into a season is unbridled optimism. The problem is I feel like I've used up a lot of my unbridled optimism over the last few years heading into different Arizona State seasons. So the the column that I wrote at Sports 360 was my Monday Musings columns. It just thought, it was simply put thoughts and questions on Sam Levitt as Arizona State starter because I've got some thoughts and I've got some questions. Do I think that Sam Levitt deserves the job? I'm not the head coach and the head coach thinks so. That's the end of that. I don't get to have an opinion that matters. I get to have an opinion. I don't get to have one that matters. I understand the need for Arizona State to find a quarterback that could be a multi-year starter uh, that can lead this team and lead to better recruiting in the future. The one thing that Kenny Dillingham is striving to become is a quarterback guy. In college football, there are a few of them, and they get to handpick who they want out of every transfer portal and out of every single high school recruiting class. Who are these quarterback guys? They are Lincoln Riley. They are Lane Kiffin, right? They're, they're, uh, there are guys out there who just, and it has nothing to do with NIL, it has to do with can you prepare me to, to be a number one pick or you know can you prepare me um, for, for eventual NFL success? There are guys out there who have a reputation with quarterbacks and that's where the quarterbacks are going to want to go year in and year out. Kenny Dillingham's trying to get on that level. He coached Jordan Travis at Florida State. Now, was he the offensive play caller? No. Was he there for Jordan Travis's best years? No. But did he help Jordan Travis develop the mindset that allowed him to seize the opportunity and have two good years at Florida State after Kenny Dillingham left? Yes. Are they still very close to this day? Yes. Now, Kenny Dillingham had time with Bo Nix at Auburn. There was a lot of things he loved about Bo Nix at Auburn, and that relationship led to Bo Nix transferring, in some part, to Oregon, where he had his best year. Now, was it his I'm on the Heisman stage year? No. Kenny Dillingham was at Arizona State when Bo Nix went through that. But Kenny Dillingham is teetering on becoming one of those quarterback guys, which will allow you to take your pick which will really drive the fate of your team and fan base if you're getting elite quarterbacks into your program year in and year out. Now, what happened last year? They they uh, believed that they had someone who went 8-2 and two at Notre Dame, had a 300-yard game against USC in Drew Pine that was there to compete with Trenton Bourget, and then at the last minute, they have the opportunity to bring in Jaden Rashada, who had had negotiations fall through on a contract he was offered for $13 million over the course of his college career at University of Florida. Um, you know, we're, we're in the infancy of NIL. Some of these checks don't clear, and because that check didn't clear, Jaden Rashada was ready to move on. Arizona State was an awesome opportunity for him to go spend a year and get away from that circus. I always considered Jaden Rashada a rental, but in the event that it worked out, 
in the event that you could get the offensive line right and you could put in a freshman plug and play right away and have him as a multi-year starter and then get yourself that reputation as quarterback guy, that's a risk you got to take. So they kind of threw Jaden Rashada into the deep end last year before he was ready. He had an old high school injury that he couldn't quite get over, decides to get surgery on that, and they spend the rest of the season having to depend on a combination of Drew Pine, Trent Borgay, Jacob Conover. Right. And it, it, it didn't go well. They, they also had Jalen Conyers uh, as a tight end throwing passes and Cam Scadaboo uh, throwing passes as well. For the second season in a row, Trenton Borgay was put in, in, in a position where he had to come in, clean up, save the day. He has five 300 plus yard passing games over, you know, over, over those two years. He came in, he did his part, but he's a sixth year senior. Arizona State's got to be looking at him like he's got to be out of here any time now. We don't want to depend on a five foot ten walk on, no matter how popular he is commercially, no matter how popular he is with his teammates or how popular he is in the community. They want a multi year starter, so they're going to bring in somebody to compete with Jaden Rashada and Trenton Borgay. That man, Sam Levitt, who spent his freshman year at Michigan State after uh, being recruited at a Westland High School in Oregon. If you followed his high school career, it's very interesting one. I believe he was uh, he was out at Westview in Oregon. He spent a year in Utah. Um, his sophomore year, I believe, spent his junior year at, at, at Westview, transferred to West Lynn, won a state championship his senior year, broke his commitment to Washington State to go to Michigan State. And then, you know, they end up with Jonathan Smith as their head coach because uh, um, their head coach uh, phone etiquette was not up to par is the best way that I can put it. So, um, you know, then they bring in a head coach that didn't recruit him out of high school. He wants no part of it. Uh, and he decides um, that he's going to go into the portal. And guess what? Guess who his first offer was coming out of high school? It was Kenny Dillingham at Florida State. The Probably one of the furthest high schools in America from Kenny Dillingham at Florida State. And, and he extends an offer to Sam Levitt, keeps that relationship going. And then Marcus Arroyo decides, you know, this is a guy that I want as well. Marcus Arroyo has been quoted as saying that, you know, at a six hour meeting with Sam Levitt to, to get him in the building, they really wanted to give him the opportunity to come in and compete to start. Uh, Kenny Dillingham said that he ran it by Jaden Rashada, ran it by Trenton Borgay. They said, cool. And so the competition was on. Now, what happened from there? Um, I'll, here's what I know. I flew in to help George Reister, and this is all in my column on sports360az.com. I flew in to help George Reister um, set up some interviews with Kenny Dillingham, Marcus Arroyo, Brian Ward, and Jaden Rashada. So, you know, he knows Marcus Arroyo from his time as the Oregon offensive coordinator. George Reister is a former Oregon tight end and former NFL tight end. So we're doing this interview and, you know, they know each other a little bit. He brings up the quarterback situation. And one of the things that Marcus Arroyo said that I found interesting, and I'm paraphrasing here, was that there's a couple of guys at Arizona State who were there the year before. He hasn't really had an opportunity to do his dil due diligence on them. But they did a bunch of due diligence on a guy that threw 50 passes for Michigan State last year, um, and they know what he's capable of, and they, they look forward to getting him in for the competition. My initial reaction to that quote was, how much harder is it to do due diligence on a guy that your boss spent a full year with the previous year? Of course you have the opportunity to do as much due diligence, if not more, on the guys who were already in the building working with the head coach that you now work for especially when one of them threw 225 more passes than Sam Levitt last year. And one of them threw about 50 more passes than Sam Levitt last year. So, you know, I, that quote right there, let me know, Oh, Sam Levitt's the guy. And I'm, I am not saying they handed him the job because I don't believe that to be true, but that they were going to give him every single opportunity to sink and swim. So what ended up happening from there is they go through spring spring practice. And what I believe is from Jaden Rashada's camp, and he was injured at the time. Um, he had, he had, uh, he had hurt his thumb. He's limited participant. He watched the competition play out and says to himself, Oh, they have their guy. So if I'm not going to play this year, I'm going to go somewhere where I'm going to get a little bit more developed. And I know that that divorce was strange between some of the alumni, Harlan Rashada, things got ugly. I don't know anything about that. I wasn't any part of that. I'm not going to badmouth somebody who is a sun devil in Harlan Rashada. And I'm not going to badmouth somebody who did nothing wrong in Jaden Rashada, who was essentially a rental. Arizona state was lucky to ever have him in the first place. He gave us a couple of cool moments. Everything I know about him, he was an upstanding cool kid who treated everybody in the building really, really well. And, and for the people that said that he left for, to secure the bag, he had big money offers. Um, and uh, yeah, he didn't take them. 
He, he, didn't, he didn't take the biggest offers and the clearest path to playing time. He went to Georgia where he believes if he's going to have to sit out this year, he will be developed uh, because he believed that Marcus Arroyo, Kenny Dillingham, and the Arizona State program had zeroed in on Sam Levitt, which was after the interview that I witnessed between George Reister and Marcus Arroyo. That's what I believed to be true as well. Now, I've had some people tell me, well, you're a Trenton Borgay fan. Yes, I am. I covered him in high school, covered him at Arizona State University. I think he's awesome as a Sun Devil. I think he's been awesome in the community. I think he's been awesome for the development of the other players. I think he's a unique, cool kid with a bright future. I love that whole family. That is true. I don't care who plays. I just want to win. That's it. I, I want the best quarterback to play, period. So this isn't about wanting Trenton Borgay to play. And also, I have to acknowledge... I am not in the building. I don't get to make any of these decisions. And if I'm going to come out and question the head coach every single time he does something, how am I adding to the experience? If I'm going to be a voice out here, I'm just going to be a sourpuss and tell him everything he's doing is wrong before he's ever had the opportunity to establish the culture that he wants as a program. No, but I do talk about Arizona state. It's part of what I do. And so I'm like, I'm going to be myself. I'm going to be honest. I do have questions about whether Sam Levitt is the answer for ASU. And not a lot of it is based on Sam Levitt. A lot of it is based on the recent history of Arizona State and how they've pursued things at the quarterback position. And I hope that people can understand it's not a slight against Sam Levitt, has nothing to do with Sam Levitt. What it has to do with is I've watched the way Arizona State has operated the last few years at quarterback. And I'm wondering, is there an opportunity to avoid some of the mistakes that have been made? So he, here's here's why. And I'm, I'm, I'll get into this a little bit more. Um, I, and I wrote in the column, it's battered fan syndrome, basically. I was optimistic uh, following Jaden Daniels' freshman season uh, when the ASU started the 2020 season, even though it was COVID, being up 13 points with less than three minutes remaining at USC. I was very optimistic until everything fell apart then. I was super optimistic heading into 2021 when ASU had the top 2022 recruiting class in the Pac-12. Jaden Daniels was getting Heisman buzz. Um, you know, the the team had like 11 future NFL players on, just on offense on the roster. And then the entire thing collapsed due to infighting over NCAA violations and whistleblowers. And Jaden Daniels put a t put together a 10 touchdown, 10 interception season with four games where he didn't even throw a touchdown pass. And then I got excited heading into 2022 because Emory Jones and Paul Tyson, two former four-star recruits were coming in to replace Jaden Daniels. But when they couldn't live up to expectations, I got optimistic and I got excited that they were bringing in Drew Pine and Jaden Rashada to replace Emory Jones and Paul Tyson. And in both of those years, it ended up, you know, Trent Borgay in, 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 in cleanup duty. Um, and so I, I'm in a situation where I'm like, okay, what if you just put the best team possible out there and you threw the guy out that had, you know, has had the most 500 yard passing games in, you know, for ASU over the last four years. Do I understand what everybody says about Trent Borgay? Have we seen his ceiling? Yeah, we've seen his ceiling. Um, you know, is is he someone who's going to throw the ball 60 yards downfield? No. Is he, he somebody, um, you know, at 5'10", 5'11", 180, that's going to be able to, to take a hit from a 6'40", 265-pound, uh, you know, uh, defensive back? Uh, or not a defensive back, that would be insane, but a, but a blitzing linebacker, not necessarily, right? Like we, we've seen these things, but we do know that he works quick. We do know that he can move the football. So I find myself reverting back into like, okay, he's still here. He's a senior leader. It's a safe option, but I'm not the coach. I'm not the coach. And I do understand wanting somebody who has the most upside, who has the most physical gifts, who has the most mobility and who you have not seen their upside. You haven't seen it. And so I personally, I fully support putting Sam Levitt out there to find out what you have in him. Because we also have Jeff Sims now. And you know what you have in him. His first ever game, he beat Kenny Dillingham in Florida State with a 300-yard game for Georgia Tech. But since then, he has had uh, what can be described as extreme turnoveritis. Um, and it caused him to lose the job at Georgia Tech, caused him to lose the job at, at Nebraska. Um, and so, you know, but 
he's here in a situation where he has a lot of physical tools and gifts. I wish the absolute best for him if he needs to come in um, in, in special package duty or to replace uh, Sam Levitt outright. God forbid something happened. But as I often point out, ASU has started multiple quarterbacks so many seasons in a row. Even Jaden Daniels freshman year, Joey Yellen, had to come in through four touchdowns against USC. So it's been a long time since Arizona State has gone a full season with one person taking the snaps. More than one person is going to need to be ready. I know Trenton Borgay is going to be ready. The fans know that too. They also, uh, there's a lot of people who don't want to see him out there because they they associate his tenure with, uh, with losing football. Even though there have been some wins mixed in, they associate his tenure with something that they want to move on from. I understand those fans completely. They deserve to have a voice just as much as I do. But that brings us down to they're handing the keys to Sam Levitt. They handed the keys to, to Jaden Rashada last year, handed the keys to Emory Jones the year before that. And I'm hoping that it works out for Sam Levitt, but we don't know. So we're going to have to see, which is why I do support putting him out there because we don't know until we know. But some of the questions that I have involve just basic questions that I wish I had asked in previous seasons and not just blindly jumped in with optimism. That doesn't mean that I'm rooting for him to fail. It just means these are the things that I would like to see addressed with him as the leader of Arizona State. I think that he's certainly more than capable to get it done, but there are some things potentially working against him. One of which is his uh, self-proclaimed demeanor. This isn't me spreading gossip or dumping on the kid. This is something that he described himself to Brad Denny. He said his leadership style is harsh. Kenny Dillingham also came out and said Sam Levitt has a tendency to yell at people, right? So because Sam Levitt has a tendency to yell at people, I look at this offense, and I'm not counting the quarterbacks here, but there's like 10 to 12 guys that were either in college football or committed to college football when Sam Levitt was still in middle school. There's a giant group of 22, 23 year olds. Three of them are on the offensive line. Two of them are playing receiver. One of them is at running back and Cam Scadabo is not exactly a spring chicken either. You have a lot of maturity on this offense. Are they going to be able to handle the 19 year old with, you know, 50 career pass attempts getting on them for not doing the things that they're supposed to? Can they handle that? Can they humble themselves? I say, if you're winning, yes. You absolutely can. Now, maybe that doesn't end up being his leadership style in a live game setting, but I only know what I know at this point. Are they going to follow Sam Levitt into battle? Are they going to buy all in? I, that, that is my hope. That is my hope. And you don't need to be a nice guy to be Arizona State's quarterback. We know this. Arizona State has had all kinds of different leadership styles uh, at, in, as their signal caller. They have Brady White, nicest guy in the entire world, you know, lead them out of the tunnel once. And he, you know, he's on the staff um, as an analyst now. They had Manny Wilkins, who was a different player every single week. You know, he was the 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 plucky young uh, guy that helped recruit his class. Um, and then after some games, he was he was super moody. Um, but he's also a guy who they tried to recruit over by bringing in Blake Barnett. And he had to go from, you know, I'm the leader of this team to I have to show my coaches that they're idiots for, for, you know, he, he had to win a quarterback battle with Brady white and Bryce Perkins, both of which went on to um, do incredible things at Memphis and, and Virginia respectively. Um, you know, in order to keep control of this team, he had to beat out Blake Barnett when chip Lindsay had to bring him in. So he wasn't always all rainbows and sunshine. And that's completely understandable. Rudy Carpenter, one of the biggest hot heads to ever play quarterback in the pac 10 he was as fiery as they come in a 10 win season. Like they had when they uh, finished playing in Texas in their bowl game, that was all good. That next year when they had a young offensive line and they were struggling and they lost at home to UNLV, that attitude, it, it didn't, it, it wasn't as effective. So there's nothing saying that Sam Levitt can't evolve his leadership style or that he needs to be the nicest guy in the entire world. None of that actually matters. All that matters is if you win. But one of the questions that I was asking is if they're not out there winning right away, especially when their first game is against Wyoming, it's going to be ugly. Again, they've allowed two 300-yard passing games in the last two years combined. And I, we saw Marcus Arroyo. All right, I, if you might not have seen it. I saw it. Marcus Arroyo went head-to-head -head with this defense once. It was ugly. Based on everything I know, I believe Arizona State's going to win this game, but I don't think it's going to be pretty. 
And if it's not pretty and Sam Levitt's out there yelling at, at, at people to try to get them on the same page as him because you know he wants to win. That's the one thing that's very evident about Sam Levitt. You know he wants to win. If he's out there trying to get everybody on his page, are they going to follow him? That's just a question. The answer could be yes. I don't feel like I'm the villain for asking it, but I had quite a few people DMing me yesterday after they read this article asking what my problem with him is. I don't have a problem with him. I just want to know, does this team have the humility to follow the young pup into battle uh, if his affect is going to be, you know, fiery to, to, to put it nicely. Um, and beyond that, one of my, one of my other big questions is just for this fan base, this fan base, uh, had been quick to judge a lot, a lot of quarterbacks. And now I, I'm not going to blame the fan base because you've been through hell. You had all the Jaden Daniels hype. And then you watched him play mediocre football, giggle to himself after every interception that he threw, uh, one read and run, uh, you watched Herm Edwards refuse to hold him accountable. You watched no offensive coordinator be able to speak into his situation with any authority because he had an over-involved parent um, with the program. And he had protectors uh, on staff that didn't even coach his side of the football. And then what happens when Jaden Daniels goes to LSU? Brian Kelly spends a whole year red face screaming at him. And then finally the kid starts thrown into coverage. And he was exactly as he was advertised. Won the Heisman became one of the top picks in the NFL draft. Like it, it, it was very, very clear that he needed accountability. We didn't see that. We didn't see that. And since then we've had five quarterbacks or including Jane Daniels, we've had five quarterbacks come and go in the last three years who left with eligibility, came in with hype and left with eligibility. And I pointed out in my article, Sam Levitt's somebody who's been to five schools in the last five years, not five colleges, I had somebody contact me and be like, you made it sound like he's been to five colleges. No, no. He's been committed to three colleges, which is a very normal thing, completely normal thing for somebody playing the quarterback position in 2024. But he moved around to different high schools. And the reason that I bring that up is because he has never had to have a sustainable leadership position over multiple years in any given situation. So it's a new situation for Sam Levitt as well. This is his first year at Arizona State, but what they're hoping for him is that he does not become one of the quarterbacks who who uh, leaves with eligibility, who tries to level up or isn't satisfied with what they're getting at Arizona State. And also, how is he going to handle Arizona State potentially bringing in somebody who is older than him or more has more hype or accolades than him at the end of this year the way that they did with him? Because it, that that is just the way that this operates now. They've already done it with Jeff Sims, right? They brought him in with the specific purpose of pushing this competition forward. What are they going to do when Jeff Sims leaves and Trenton Borgay leaves? You know, who knows how things are going to work out with Michael Tollefson, the quarterback that they've had committed to them for the last year and a half. He's ineligible for his senior season if he sticks at Tustin High School. So he's going to have to move high schools even to get some playing time. Who knows if he'll be ready to go right away? My guess is they bring in somebody to compete with Sam Levitt going into next year as well, just for roster balance. How is somebody uh, like Sam Levitt going to handle those things? These are all just questions I want to know because I believe that they will happen. And beyond that, the fan base, to come back to the fan base, it has not been a fan base that has exercised much patience. So here is how I finished my article. I want this fan base to give Sam Levitt four games before making any type of judgment at all. Because I'm telling you right now, if he looks good in this Wyoming game, whatever, I'll jump on the hype train. I'll drive it myself. I will. Because this is not a team that you should look good against. Especially given the fact that Wyoming's new offensive coordinator, Jay Johnson, guess whose coach he was last year? Sam Levitt's at Michigan State. So he's had the opportunity to prepare this Wyoming defense. He's probably the only person in the country who knows as much about Sam Levitt as Kenny Dillingham and Marcus Arroyo do. So you have Jay Johnson there. You have a defense that makes everything ugly. Forget this Wyoming game. Let Sam Levitt go out there and try to get a win. And then let's judge Sam Levitt after Mississippi State and Texas State and Texas Tech because all three of those teams had four games where they gave up 275 passing yards or more last year. They're going to be the ones that, that like they have the tendency and they haven't made any changes really on the defensive side of the ball. They're going to be the ones 
that allow you to see what Sam Levitt's capable of. So let's get back together in four games and let's make an ultimate judgment on him. But my, my one of the questions I have is, does the fan base have four games in them? There are certain members of the fan base that are never going to have four minutes in them. They're going to be super reactive, and I understand that. But I'm asking about the people who actually contribute to NIL, who went to games when, you know, back to back three and nine seasons, who who stayed with this team through the NCAA investigation, who stayed with this team through all the frustration with former athletic director Ray Anderson. Can you just give the kid four games before you even think to yourself, you know, what else do we want to do here? And would I be advocating for four games for Sam Levitt if I if my whole angle here was to get somebody else to start? I don't think so. So anyway, all of that is in an article that I wrote on uh, sports360az.com. Please help support them um, as they cover Arizona State this year. Again, Jordan Ham does the most incredible job, and I'm going to be plugging his work all year long on this podcast as well as on the Wednesday night spaces. But that that is my preview of the upcoming Wyoming week as well as a giant rant on the state of the program and the quarterbacks moving forward. But it, it is Wyoming week. I do not expect it to be pretty. I just expect Arizona State to come out with a win no matter what it takes. So we're going to try and do this segment every single week. This is a new segment right here on the forecast. Hopefully you're having a good time. Um, But this is our Todd of the Week segment. What do I mean by Todd of the Week? I'm talking about Todd Graham. Now, whatever you think of him as a man or a coach, completely irrelevant to this segment. This is about the fact that Todd Graham spent so much of his time at ASU fundraising and ultimately donating a million of his own money to help modernize the program, bring it into the present, uh, get the stadium upgrades paid for. Um, This is about honoring somebody this week who uh, went out of their way to do something to help Arizona State University grow. Sometimes this is going to have to do with uh, NIL. Sometimes it's going to be an act of kindness. Um, It's going to vary from week to week, but this week, and this is not a sponsored segment, by the way, I want to name Tim Hovick, this episode's Todd of the Week. Uh, You can read about this on sports360az.com, by the way. Tim Hovick, the owner of Santan Ford, he donated 10 brand new Mustang Mach-E's, probably on lease, to Arizona State's athletic programs. So the, the ASU NIL Collective, Sun Angel, all of that, all of those funds are being used in various ways to help grow and maintain uh, Arizona State's ability to acquire and um, and retain its talent uh, because that is what college sports are about now. This is going to be massively, massively helpful, and it's going to spur other people to uh, to donate some of their time and resources as well. I think this is so cool. Uh, as 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 early as five years ago, I had conversations with players on the team When I asked them, you know, what is one thing that you feel like you need? Uh, Vehicle use was one of the top things. Like once they got food taken care of, once the the fact that like uh, it wasn't a violation for a snack bar to be open um, to these players, uh, the next thing really became transportation. Can we live off campus? Can we get ourselves to and from practice? Having access to to 10 brand new Mustang Mach-E's is is going to um, help Arizona State compete with some of these programs like Utah where, you know, everybody got on a car lease. And I know that Arizona State has had individual players that that, that have been able to partake in, in car leases. I know that some of them went well. Some of them, uh, former quarterback, I think they had to go and get the car from him um, after he left town. But, you know, they, they're, <laughs> there are uh, the, these are college kids. Um, they are they are brand new to some of this. But the fact that uh, they're going to have just more than one, the fact that they're going to have these resources available to them, uh, it, it's just going to be one more thing to help Arizona State's All right, and our last grow. segment today. So congratulations again, to thank Santana you to everybody who Tim Hovick. Listen to this podcast. Not a sponsored segment. Thank you, you to Philip at 1012 Podcast Network of for uh, bringing me out of retirement and getting me back into the ASU podcasting game. But uh, we're going to end every single week with uh, some sign suggestions. Now, I'm not, I'm not doing sign stealing. I'm not Connor Stallions. But some sign suggestions. I'm going to be flying in from Charlotte to go to this home opener. I'm going to be in the crowd feeling a little conflicted. I'm sure I'll have a little tummy issues no matter what happens. Don't love to see Wyoming lose. Don't love to see Arizona State uh, lose. But it needs to happen, right? Wyoming's not winning any national championships. 
Uh, I need Arizona State to compete for the Big 12. They were picked to finish last, which is ridiculous. Sam Levitt was picked by Pro Football Focus, which is, I don't think, ever been right about anything when it comes to quarterbacks, uh, as the second worst quarterback heading into this Big 12 season. I need people and pundits to be proven wrong. I need this talent level of Arizona State that, you know, they brought in through the transfer portal that they've developed, this coaching staff, which I got a ton of faith in. I think Jason Mons is a genius. I think Sean Aguano is a genius. I think Charlie, Charlie Regal is the best human being in the world. And I've wanted Kenny Dillingham to be the head coach of Arizona State since he was at Memphis, right? I, I, I wanted a Sun Devil to take this program over. Um, I am rooting for Arizona State uh, above all else you can believe if you don't believe that it is what it is, but I'm going to be there. I'm going to be wearing gold. I think that's what they're, they're suggesting. And I'm going to be cheering for Arizona state against Wyoming, even though that is kind of similar to one of their colors, but if we're loud enough, then they will not, uh, the, you know, the, the, they won't be tricked into believing that they're up at elevation in Laramie, but signs of the week, right? So I'm, I'm going to give you a couple of things each and every week that I know uh, they're, they're not out of pocket. I used to bring signs to the games when I was in the student section. They'd get a little weird. I was never completely out of pocket. I remember we played San Jose State. I uh, had a sign that said uh, San Jose is full of beaches, um, which I don't even know if that's true. I've never been there, uh, but that's about as blue as I got with the uh, with, with the signage. But every week I'd bring a goofy sign. And so uh, these are my sign suggestions heading into Wyoming, at ASU. I hope you enjoy. Number five, if you really, really want to get on a University of Wyoming fan's nerves, all you need to do is hold up a sign that says Fort Collins is better. I don't know if you know anything about Wyoming football. You shouldn't. There's enough stuff to worry about in this world without without uh, having an obsession of, you know, of a town of 20,000 people that plays in, in uh, seven and six football in the Mountain West. But Fort Collins, Colorado is just south of the Wyoming, Colorado border. It is gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous city. It's where Colorado State plays and their rivalry. It's the border wars. It's like we have our thing with Tucson. They have their thing with Fort Collins, only it's the exact opposite, right? Tempe, beautiful. Tucson, uh, something other than beautiful in the minds of a lot of Arizona State fans. Laramie is a 7,200 foot high windswept hellscape when the temperature gets below a certain level. Uh, not a lot of mountains blocking anything out there. It's a really, really tough place to play. And it's not the easiest city to live in either. So, there is a tinge of jealousy when it comes to the fact that Fort Collins, Colorado, one of the most gorgeous places in America. So number five, if you want to get on a Wyoming fan's nerves in a wholesome way, hold up a sign. Fort Collins is better. I promise it will get to them. Number four, elevation, and then a little greater sign, elevation, right? One of the things that Wyoming fans are super proud of is the fact that they'll get you up to 7,200 feet and suffocate you, right? And at former, <laughs> if anybody knows about this, is former Arizona State safety Jordan Clark, who spent from 2020 to 2023 in the program. His dad went to play in Denver that year, got, you know, elevation sickness, and it almost killed him, almost cost him his NFL career, right? People go out to, to, to play at University of Wyoming. They gas out in the wildest ways the wildest ways i remember appalachian state went out there last year they were up 19 to 8 in the fourth quarter setting up for a field goal with like eight minutes left and lost they just gassed out the, the elevation makes you crazy um and so i i think that'd be a fun sign to see from an asu fan elevation is greater than elevation can wyoming come and play in this disgusting heat that we have uh, in what was norm, uh, formerly known as, as, uh, as Sun Devil Stadium. Um, I guess I can call it Mountain America. If they want to pay me to call it Mountain America, I would enjoy that as well. So number four, elevation is better than elevation. Sign number three. Sign number three. And uh, not to get political. I don't think this is political. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong and you do believe it to be political. Anytime... You see Evan Svoboda throw an incomplete pass, which will happen. It's not an efficiency-based offense. Or anytime John Hoyland misses a field goal, which is even more rare, but it happens. If you hold up a sign that says Dick Cheney had better aim than that, that'll give them a little giggle, and it will uh, it, it will insult uh, Wyoming's most famous resident, 
uh, former vice president Dick Cheney. Again, not a political thing, but he did shoot a man in the face one time. And sometimes it's fun to remind people um, that that did happen. All right, my number two sign suggestion, and I don't know if you want to actually do this because it might not necessarily bring the best karma upon our program. We have obviously lost plenty of players who had eligibility left to other programs. Uh, Ricky Pearsall, Johnny Wilson, Jaden Daniels, to name a few. However, thanks for Xavier Valade. I think I think it's perfectly acceptable to do it out of a sense of true gratitude. If you're not a troll, gratitude is important. I'm a big believer in gratitude. I'm going to sign this show off the same way that I sign off Sun Devil Spaces recognizing that gratitude makes the world a wondrous place. However, if you want to give him a little bit of a sardonic thank you, uh, because he wasn't able to finish his career in Laramie, because the greener pastures were in Tempe, Arizona, I think that's perfectly acceptable. And if somebody accuses you of being a troll, just like, no, I'm I'm actually very sincere. Thank you for Xavian Valaday. That would be my number two sign suggestion. And number one, number one, a little dangerous. A little bit, a little bit of a backstory here. Wyoming claims a country singer, and if there's any country, like true country fans, not pop country, but the true country fans who just, um, they, they love the the authentic guys out there that have been wearing the same jeans and cowboy hat for the last forty years. The Joe Healy's that that uh, the love George Strait and go to his sold out shows. You have to understand that Wyoming believes very strongly that Chris Ledoux, uh, rest in peace, been gone for for uh, for 20 years now. They believe and claim Chris Ledoux as a Wyomingite. I believe he passed away in, in Casper, Wyoming. He, he became famous uh, from his time writing songs in, in, in Wyoming and gigging out of Wyoming. He has his own whiskey out there. There's a bar in my hometown named after him. They love Chris Ledoux. Chris Ledoux is extraordinarily important to Wyomingites and Wyoming fans. But here's the truth. And if if you want to get in a little bit of trouble here and and you direct this at Wyoming fans, the players might not get this one, but for the fans, it's going to sting. Chris Ledoux is from Mississippi. So if you're brave enough to hold that up on a sign, you'll get somebody's attention. But some of those cowboys, they're not so nice, especially when, when, when you go after their sacred tent poles. So my number one, Sign suggestion for this upcoming game, August 31st, Wyoming at Arizona State. Chris Ledoux is from Mississippi. All right, we did it. This has been the inaugural episode of The Forecast. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. And uh, if, if you like listening to me talk, uh, you're going to love you talking to me instead of me talking. Come and hang out on Wednesday night on Twitter or X or whatever we're calling it now. Join Sun Devil Spaces, hang out with the community, 8 p.m. Arizona time every single Wednesday. Would love to uh, to chat with you in there um, and get you plugged in with the Sun Devil community and just have some fun. Um, if you want to see uh, more of my work, I write for sports360az.com. My high school coverage is on arizonavarsity.com, and I cover college football in general alongside George Reister at the Unafraid Show. Our podcast is called The College Football Apostles. I really, really appreciate anybody who took the time to listen to this, and shout out to all my media friends who are going to be working this weekend. I'm watching the game from the stands for the first time in like 11 years uh, instead of being there in a, in a media capacity. And I am so excited to just be out there, have a beverage, cheer on the Sun Devils, and watch my other favorite team lose a game. Uh, and I'm really looking forward to, to seeing people from spaces in person out there at Mountain America Stadium, Frank Cush Field. It's going to be so much fun. So we'll end this show the same way that we end Sun Devil Spaces every single week. If you live with a heart of gratitude, the world is a wondrous place. Forks up. Catch you next week.